Hi there, and welcome back, finally, to the fifth uh, and final video of my series on prayer. Please accept my apologies for getting this out so late. Um, things got off track and carried away, and uh, this fell to uh, a level of my list, to-do list, that I probably shouldn't have. So uh, thank you for your patience, and uh, I'm hopeful that the people who saw the videos earlier will at least get to see this one as well. And I've learned a lesson too. Uh, I've learned that for next time, and I do hope to do something similar again, another kind of series of videos, that I'm just going to shoot them all beforehand and then release them. I'm not going to uh, space them out over time to allow myself to procrastinate and you know, get off track. So, um, with that, uh, so again, thank you. And with this final lesson or final session on prayer, I'm going to focus on those that I will call the master servants. So Jesus is the master, obviously, and his servants are the saints. And for our purposes in this series, it's really the, the saints that have shown us how to pray. The saints that have been forerunners, masters, if you will, in prayer. That have principles and approaches and lessons they can teach us that still are valuable and applicable for us right here and now in 2020. So I'm going to talk about three of those master servants. I'd love to talk about a lot more of them, but uh, the video would be too long. And I'm not an expert uh, on these three, but I'm certainly not an expert on a lot of the others that I considered. Um, finally, uh, be sure to check the show more, the description underneath the YouTube uh, video, and that'll give you things like an outline and additional resources for um, reading and study and so forth, and my contact information. Thanks, and let's get into the video. The first of the master servants that I want to talk about is St. Ignatius of Loyola. St. Ignatius, you may know, was the founder of the Society of Jesus, commonly known as the Jesuits. In the 16th century, he was a, fr uh, a Spanish man and um, someone who in his early life was seeking fame, fortune, notoriety, prestige through what was a common track at the time, uh, through war. He wanted to be a noble uh, knight and he did so. But that led him to, um, to a failure of sense. He got hurt. He got hurt real bad and had a period of convalescence. And during that period, Ignatius was given some books to read. And he noticed over that time that it, as he read the books about knights and so forth, he got a lot of pleasure out of them. But when he read books about the saints he got a deeper, more abiding joy. And over time, he, he, he understood the distinction and realized that this was kind of a, a lens into his life and the choice ahead of him. Did he want to pursue the path he had been pursuing, that of knighthood and so forth? Or did he want to do something a little bit more unique, you might say. And thankfully, he chose the latter. Ignatius, then, is really the master of discernment. Discernment is at the heart of his spiritual program. Ignatius, unlike, I think, really any other spiritual author, gave a systematic approach, um, a series of steps, exercises he called them, and principles to guide those desiring 
in his day, primarily those desiring to enter the society of Jesus, a way to make that choice, right, with God's grace. Um, but for us, generally, Ignatius's principles can be used to discern in life all the time, whether big or small decisions, whether decisions about um, morals, you know, what is the right thing to do in a given situation, or uh, vocational decisions, you know, what is God calling me to do in, with my life? Uh, and it could be um, questions within that framework, you know, what is uh, God calling my husband and I to do right now? Do we need to stay here in Williamsburg? Do we need to leave and pursue some other career? That kind of thing. It can be used for all of that stuff. And uh, what I like about it so much is that it's, it's practical, it's grounded in human experience and reality. Uh, it employs all the dimensions of us. So our minds, our spirits, our hearts, right? our, our feelings, passions, our thoughts, um, and brings them all to bear in our relationship with God and our sense and discernment of where he's leading us. So I want to go um, just into one, um, one little thing here about Ignatius, one um, kind of a basis of his thought. You see, in the, um, even in the Society of Jesus with Jesuits today, every Jesuit goes through what's called the spiritual exercises, and it consists in their place over a four-week retreat. And each week has a spiritual theme. And um, at the beginning is kind of this um, juxtaposition between sin and grace and choosing God. And then you go through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, the spiritual exercises are not limited to Jesuits. Other folks do it. Uh, and other people do them in more elongated formats. So uh, they might do it over the course of a year. Or I've done, you know, week-long versions of them. Um, but at the beginning of the spiritual exercises, no matter how you're doing them, is what's called the principle and foundation. And Ignatius put this at the beginning because he thought, it was the foundation of everything that lay ahead. So I want to do two things. I want to read to you the original, a literal translation of his original Spanish, or, uh, and then I'm going to read to you a contemporary version. So this is the, the literal translation from the original. God created human beings to praise, reverence, and serve God, and by doing this to save their souls. God created all other things on the face of the earth to help fulfill this purpose. From this, it follows that we are to use the things of this world only to the extent that they help us to this end. And we ought to rid ourselves of the things of this world to the extent that they get in the way of this end. For this, it is necessary to make ourselves indifferent to all created things as much as we are able, so that we do not necessarily want health rather than sickness riches rather than poverty, honor rather than dishonor, a long life rather than a short life, and so in all the rest, so that we might ultimately desire and choose only what is most conducive for us to the end for which God created us. So you can sense that uh, line in the sand right there, you know, it's a verse, attachment and detachment. Things in the world are only so good as they lead to our most fundamental purpose, which is to love God, to live with him forever, to have, uh, to have our souls saved, right? Salvation. Here's the contemporary version. And this is just, there are a lot of different kinds or versions of contemporary versions. Uh, but this one is by David Fleming, a Jesuit. He says, the goal of our life is to live with God forever. God who loves us gave us life. Our own response of love allows God's life to flow into us without limit. 
All the things in this world are gifts of God presented to us that we can know God more easily and make a return of love more readily. As a result, we appreciate and use all these gifts of God insofar as they help us develop as loving persons. But if any of these gifts become the center of our lives, they displace God and so hinder our growth toward our goal. In everyday life, then, we must hold ourselves in balance before all of these created gifts insofar as we have a choice and are, not bound, and are not bound by some obligation. We should not fix our desires on health or sickness, wealth or poverty, success or failure, a long life or a short one. For everything has the potential of calling, in, calling forth in us a deeper response to our life in God. Our only desire and our one choice should be this. I want and I choose what better leads to God's deepening his life in me. I'll just read that last part again. Our only desire and our one, our one choice should be this. So with all the choices we face every day, big and small, seemingly insignificant and seemingly very significant to our life, we should only consider this. I want and I choose what better leads to God's deepening his life in me. That's the principle and foundation of Ignatius of Loyola. You can find a lot of stuff good on the internet. I'm going to put a couple books, um, actually one that I'm thinking of in particular, about uh, further rules of discernment that Ignatius wrote. Um, and I'll put that in the commentary section so you can check that out after. Um, okay, let's go to the next saint. Um, Therese, Saint Therese of Lisieux, uh, also known as the Little Flower. Saint Therese, uh, one of my favorite saints. I had the good pleasure of going to Lisieux and uh, seeing the home she grew up in and uh, the church she attended. And they now have a, a big shrine basilica. Uh, there in the town um, and what drew me to Therese from the beginning and what still uh, keeps me close to her uh, makes me spiritually comfortable with her you might say is that Therese over time came to know accept and love herself authentically. And uh, this was brought about by God's great love for her, Jesus' great love for her, and her understanding, knowledge, and acceptance, and dependence upon that love. Um, Therese was a humble person. Okay. Now, as I've said uh, very often in the reconciliation, reconciliation and in Mass and so forth, uh, is that humility is not necessarily putting ourselves down. Right? But to be humble is to know who we are. And who we are is a paradox. On one hand, we are, uh, you know, uh, an infinite creature. We have a, a, an eternal soul. We are beloved children of God. We are created uniquely and intentionally by God for a purpose. But on the other hand, we are infinitely small and insignificant and fragile and broken, right? We're made of dust and to dust we shall return. So, there's this paradox in us, and humility is understanding that about ourselves and holding those two in tension without veering too far or being overcome by either side. Okay, and, and I think Therese did that well. Uh, and I want to just highlight a few things. Um, Therese realized, you know, she was uh, 19th century little town, northern France. Uh, from a very devout, love it, uh, loving family. And she decided at a very early age that she wanted to enter Carmel, right? so a cloistered Carmelite monastery, and there was one there in her hometown. 
And she did so with the help of the Pope and others at the age of 15. She died at age 24. So, a short life. But even that shortness and what she discovered was her own smallness even with those two things, the shortness of the time of her life and the smallness of her character as she perceived it, it was those recognitions, it was the recognition of her smallness and that shortness of time that really led to her grandeur. And Therese is the only, um, well, one of four female doctors of the church. Uh, there are only about 33, I think, doctors of the church. I might be one or two off there. Uh, and the doctors of the church are, are um, individuals over the life of the church's history that have uh, taught and espoused, uh, expounded upon Christian doctrine um, in a way that really led and helped the church understand itself and its mission. Uh, it was J.P. St. John Paul II that named Therese a uh, a doctor of the church and Therese had grown up you know with these kind of bold dreams she wanted to do something great for God something great for Jesus but as she grew up and um, as a young child she she came to realize that she was probably we would call neurotic uh, she was very very sensitive easily thrown about emotionally mentally spiritually uh, the littlest thing could th send her into a tantrum. And she grew up, she realized, though, over time that she had these weaknesses, these struggles, that she was sensitive, right? She was small. Um, and so she said to herself, uh, I'm not like those great spiritual masters of old. You know, I'm not a, um, a Teresa of Avila or I'm not a, a Catherine of Siena, you know, uh, I'm not a Francis of Assisi. So she set herself to do this, what she called her little way. And that was to do acts of charity, very small acts, with great love. Um, she would do uh, one example that is still very memorable is that there was a, another sister in her convent that she really didn't like. She was a gruff, mean, rude sister, and she gave Therese all kinds of trouble, and Therese didn't like her at all. But Therese determined to act as if she loved this, <laughs> as if she loves this sister. And she did just that, and, she, and that love for her, for that sister, grew in her heart so much, and in her actions so much, that that sister came to think that she was Therese's best friend. But in Therese's journal, it's very clear that she really did not like this woman at all. Right? So it was these little things that Therese did that showed that she had this great love in her heart. Um, she took advantage of each and every small little moment, moments that were known only to God. And truly, if she had not been convinced by her superiors and her sisters in the order to write a little autobiography while she was dying of tuberculosis toward the ends of her life, none of this would have been captured. None of it. It's only by grace that it happened. And she would have been just as saintly, but she would have not been known by the church or the world whatsoever. Um, thanks God, thanks be to God that she was, uh, that that did happen. Um, a couple other things. In um, 19, or 1891, there was a retreat there at the Carmel that she had uh, given by a priest. And he focused on God's love and mercy um, and tenderness. And uh, it's really struck Therese because at the time, especially in France, uh, there was kind of the wake of Jansenism and Jansenism was a, a school of thought that ended up became uh, getting uh, proclaimed heretical by the church 
um, but it emphasized really the baseness of humanity and the ne absolute need for really strict moral rigor to pull ourselves out of that. It was almost like um, a very uh, Calvinist approach to human nature. And, um, but even though it had been condemned, that was lingering in that, uh, in that time and place. And most of the spiritual formation that she got was of that th thinking, right? Um, that emphasized, um, you know, uh, God's punishment, God's wrath, hell, the pain of purgatory, the need for absolute rigor in, uh, uh, discipline to our, our ourselves so as to attain to uh, heaven. And when this priest gave the other retreat, it really touched her. And he said to her that your faults, your faults do not offend God. And I don't mean faults as in sins, right? Sins do offend God. But faults like your weaknesses. Right? The fact that you're a sensitive soul, the fact that you might be a little obsessive or neurotic, right? uh, the fact that you are not super eloquent or capable of grand acts for the church. And that is what helped her to realize that along with her use of the Bible. She uh, was an early uh, an early adopter of, of direct reading the Bible herself, which was very uncommon at the time. She used to carry the Gospels and the letters of St. Paul around all the time. Um, and those two things really led her into deeper relationship with Jesus, deeper relation, uh, acceptance of his love unconditionally, right? And a love that could shore up her weaknesses, that can use her weaknesses to reveal God's power. And that's just what he did. That's just what he did. Uh, with Therese, the, as she would say, the smallest of souls, what was revealed was the very strength and mighty power of God in her. And to this day, she is one of the most beloved saints, inspirational of saints, um, and the patron saint of missionaries, oddly enough, um, because she, she had a burning love for God and the church and the world. And she concluded that that's what she would be, is love in the heart of the church. Uh, Therese, uh, in that recognition of who she was, an acceptance of God's love and bold response to it, even in the little tiny place that was her Carmel in northern France, 19th century, she showed us that the littlest of lives can have the grandest of impacts. Finally, uh, the third person I want to talk about is St. Francis of Assisi. Now, I started to get interested. I mean, I, of course, I knew about Francis growing up. And a lot of what we get about Francis is pretty um, elementary, I would say. Um, often kind of piously angelically portrayed you know you see the holy cards he's got the halo and uh he's you know looking up at the tree or the bird and that's all good right but francis was a very human man and there's a lot about his life that most people don't know for example um you know he was a well-educated and not a simple-minded person he, of course, knew his native Italian at the time. He knew Latin. He also knew French because his father traveled in France doing business. And Francis accompanied him on these journeys oftentimes, learned French, knew French poetry, could recite it. And um, he used that uh, with his gregarious nature to um, kind of be the life of the town of Assisi. You know, he was, uh, he's often portrayed as kind of a partier, like a drunkard, but that wasn't it so much. It was just that he loved life. He loved being around people. He had vitality. And he liked to be at the center of things, right? As so many of us do. 
but uh, it's kind of similar to Ignatius. You know, um, Francis wanted to um, kind of earn his stripes and gain some notoriety and so forth, and so he went to battle, um, as was the case at that time. And he was injured, and it changed him. And um, he tried to go to battle again once and um, ended up turning back. It had so deeply uh, affected him. And um, in a process of kind of conversion and discernment, uh, he realized that he wanted to live a life much more similar to Jesus than he had ever thought. He wanted, he didn't really know what it was, but he wanted to live a life of charity, of giving of love, um, and ra and it came more and more of a radical discipleship kind of life. And um, there was a pivotal moment, which if you've seen, um, you know, documentaries or the movies about Francis, you know, you, that scene where he gave up, renounced his inheritance. His father was a wealthy man, and he stripped naked in front of his father and the bishop and renounced all of his possessions and inheritance. And that is, to some degree, true. Um, what had happened was uh, Francis, you know, in that desire to give, started giving things away and things that weren't his, his father's stuff. And his father got very upset and publicly embarrassed him and shamed him in front of the town, dis, um, you know, uh, threatening to disown him and so forth. And it was that moment uh, that it came to... Uh, uh, climax and uh, of that conflict and in front of the bishop Francis did indeed renounce his inheritance entirely and renounce his father and his family um, name which we can't even understand how important that was um, for them back then so after that happens Francis goes and and starts to live a new life that he doesn't know what uh, what it will be. Uh, it's you know, often portrayed that kind of as soon as that happened, he was joined by these companions and they started the friars and it all went, you know, great from there on. It was not that way. Francis spent probably a couple years in almost total isolation. He uh, popped around to a couple of religious communities, but then he ended up back in the streets of his hometown and he became a friend of the poor uh, the impoverished, the homeless, the lepers, and stuff in that town. Um, and I think it's that um, these experiences, right? First, uh, the experience with his, his father, the desire for charity, and um, a Christ-like life in his heart, and then the experience of the rejection of his family the, and uh, even the rejection of the community. Uh, certainly a town where he would have known everyone, you know. Um, it was that isolation that led him to a radical dependency on Jesus and eventually a radical imitation of Jesus. And what were some of the hallmarks of that life that ended up coming, becoming and transforming into the Franciscan life? Well, poverty. And in Francis's day, it was radical poverty in the sense that he nor any of his companions were allowed to own anything, either individually or communally. Even the, the places that they lodged in, which weren't much at all, uh, they rented uh, from other religious communities. Even if it was only kind of a small token of payment, they did not own those beds of straw that they lived on. And for this, Francis um, uh, gained a radical dependence on God's providence. It's similar to what happened with Mother Teresa, if you know her story. You know, Mother Teresa, um, in, for many years, did not allow the sisters of her order to have freezers in their houses because she wanted them to depend day to day, <laughs> every day, anew, on God's grace and God's generosity. It's very similar to what Francis did. Um, Francis wanted them to depend on the generosity of people and he wanted them to serve those people. 
right? It encouraged that generosity, that fervor, that love for God. Uh, penance, that was another thing, First Francis. Um, he lived a penitent life. You know, he, he, he wore um, the habit, which was nothing more than just a common um, cloak that was rough to wear and uncomfortable. Um, he lived in simplicity. Um, so as to, um, I'd say, make up for a lot of the uh, sins, but more so the extravagance that he witnessed at the time um, to show that one can be happy without all of the excess, right? Um, and um, I think he did that, uh, he lived that penitent life for the sake of the good of those people that he was serving uh, spiritually, for their spiritual good. Um, you know, sacrifices and penances for them. Uh, but it's also helpful to not um, have too extreme of a view. I recently read a book on Francis, and um, it's, it, it was uh, the case that at times they feasted. You know, he and his earliest companions. Yes, they fasted quite a bit. But when times of joy came, they would eat meat, they would eat, uh, nice cheeses and breads, and they would even drink wine from time to time. So they knew the balance, right, between fasting and feasting. Um, you know, both, both are essential to a genuine spiritual life. So um, I'll conclude with uh, the story of um, Francis's death. Now, um, toward the end of his life, his health started to deteriorate, and... Um, after a long period of solitude retreat, he received the stigmata. Um, and he spent the rest of his life um, suffering really greatly, actually, not just physically, but also as he saw the community that he had grown, that he had built and started, uh, already start to splinter and distance itself from him personally and distance itself from the principles that he thought were so important. Um, there's a movie that if you want to know a little bit more about uh, Francis might be good. It's called The Sign of Contradiction. It was, it was a documentary done by um, the Franciscans here in the U.S. Um, but at the end of um, that movie, um, it, it says that Francis's spirituality was a realization that you are who you are before God and God alone. You are who you are before God alone. Nothing else matters in the end. Right? The perceptions, judgments, fondness, or unfairness of the world will all fall away, will all disappear, and will not be remembered. The only thing that matters is who we are before God. Francis, at the end of his life, uh, forced his most intimate friends, as he was coming up to the very moment of his death, to lay him outside on the earth in the middle of winter, naked. He, and he, uh, he was stripped naked because Francis wanted to die like Jesus. Uh, it almost brings me to tears just thinking about it. He, he knew Jesus loved him so much. And he loved Jesus so much that he wanted to live Jesus' life. And that only happened by Jesus living in him. And he wanted to have his final moment be one of closeness and imitation of his Lord, his master, his brother, and his friend. So... Ignatius of Loyola, Therese of Lisieux, Francis of Assisi, three great spiritual masters, servants of the one master. Um, read the description uh, below for some more additional information and some good resources. And I'll just conclude with the final sum thoughts in summary. Um, a professor of mine in seminary 
wise man priest said, you know, eighty percent of he was saying talking about priestly ministry, but he said eighty percent is showing up, ten percent is acting like you want to be there, and ten percent leave to the Holy Spirit. I think that goes for prayer too. I hope that as you go forth from this series, that you desire to pray, to pray better, to pray more perhaps, and to pray in different ways that can help you expand your heart, your mind, your soul for prayer. Just remember though, that 80% is showing up. That's the most important thing. Just praying, not worrying about how I'm praying, but praying. That's the most important thing. You know, 10% act like you want to be there. Act like you want to pray. And 10% leave the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help you along. Don't be afraid. God wants you to know him. He knows you and he wants you to know him. Um, finally, uh, I will conclude that um, with someone I didn't get to cover, but St. Francis de Sales, um, 17th century um, master, French saint, bishop during the post-Reformation period. And he counseled a lot of lay folks in their spiritual life, which was somewhat revolutionary at that time. And he said to them that your spiritual life is not going to be like the one of a diocese, a parish priest. And it's not going to be like the one of a cloistered monk or a cloistered sister, right? The, the prayer life of a businessman or a man working 60 hours a week in a factory is going to be different than a 16-year-old kid at a prep school. So as you go about this, uh, hopefully to improve your prayer life, remember that your prayer life is your prayer life. It's not anyone else's. It's not a copy of anyone else's. It's yours. And it should be tailored to who you are and your life. Okay, your responsibilities, your obligations, what you do and don't do. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Thanks again for your patience. And until we see each other again, which I hope is soon, God bless you. And may you have peace.